meeting. Yeah, let's proceed to the uh, mic. Can you please proceed? Oh, okay. So our theme, yeah. Okay, so, okay. What Our theme for this afternoon, GMM, is Industry Outlook in a Post-COVID Environment. Resilient and vul Vulnerable Industries in Your Investment Portfolio. And now to introduce our guest speaker, may I call on Ms. Mignon Ramos, Chair of the Sheffield Programs Committee. Good afternoon. Um, our speaker today has a long-standing career in asset management spanning over three decades and a proven best-in-class track record in managing diversified multi-asset class investment portfolios. Mr. Paul Joseph Garcia, our PJ, is the CEO and co-founder of Grow Capital Partners, a privately held alternative investment management advisory company focused on providing bespoke fiduciary investment solutions for family offices and institutional investors and real estate investment management, such as managing real estate private equity and REIT asset manager. He's adjunct professor for portfolio and investment management at the Asian Institute of Management uh, and a member of the board of trustees of the University of Asia and the Pacific. PJ was the CEO of Lichu Management Inc., an investment management advisory firm specialized in real estate. Before that, he was senior vice president and head of institutions <coughs> of BPI's asset management and trust group, responsible for the relationship management of close to 2,000 institutional clients. I actually met PJ when he was the investment officer or CIO of ING Investment Management Philippines. The, the business activities of ING Man Manila's trust business while concurrently supervising the investment management of all of its discretionary assets, both institutional and retail accounts, with assets under management of around 82 billion pesos. The firm was awarded Best Asset Management Company in the country in 2010 by the Asset Magazine. ING's Philippine Asset Management business was then acquired by BPI in 2011. PJ also headed Metrobank's Treasury Group's Foreign Currency Fixed Income and Emerging Markets Trading Desk. In 1998, uh, PJ was transferred to SG Securities, where he worked as an investment analyst, focusing on the Philippine banking set sector. An e economist by training with a graduate degree in industrial economics from the CRC, or the precursor of the University of Asia and the Pacific. He is recognized among the most astute, astute fixed income investors for the Philippines and the rest of Asia for multiple years. PJ was also a former president of the Fund Managers Association of the Philippines, an association of investment professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. PJ Garcia. PJ. Thank you, Mignon, for that very generous uh, introduction. I hope you can hear me. Um, so I'm um, happy to be with you this afternoon. Uh, share with you um, my views on, on this post-pandemic uh, scenarios no? uh, for the market. Let me just uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I hope I can... Uh, Keep it in my time limit of 10 minutes. Uh, please let me know if I'm going over time. I may talk forever. But first of all, I'd like to um, also mention, uh, uh, I'm happy to be here to be with Sherfield. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago when Sherfield was starting at Oregon Francis Lim and, um, and uh, some ICD guys like uh, uh, were... were uh, uh, starting Sherfield at the time when I was in BPI. And I'm just happy now that uh, Sherfield has been one of the moving um, associations no? protecting the rights of minority shareholders in the market. So um, let, me, let me start. Okay, one second. Um, well, first of all, let me just share my favorite uh, quote. No? I guess in this kind of market, and I've seen uh, already in my lifetime two cycles, huh? uh, or in terms of you know crisis in this kind of magnitude, the uh, Asian fi financial crisis in the late 90s, 
in the global financial crisis, crisis in the towards the end of la the last decade. And now we're seeing a pandemic health crisis that we're seeing. And one thing is common, um, if you are to make money or invest in this kind of market. No? And um, this uh, quote, uh, I'll translate it into English. Uh, it's called, you know, fortune favors the brave. No? And I would say this kind of market is really for the brave of heart only. You know? And uh, as you can see here, uh, in terms of the valuations uh, for 2000. Um, 20, you know, we haven't seen this kind of uh, market valuation since the last global financial crisis in 2009. And uh, as you can see here, we haven't actually, we almost uh, touched the, the low of around eight, nine times uh, PE multiple. Uh, I think we were a bit short of that in the third week of March. But from then, of course, we've seen a nice rebound from uh, the, the low of 4,600 uh, in, in, in late March. And now we're seeing, of course, a, a nice rebound in the market. As you can see here, um, in terms of market cap to GDP, um, we've seen here three different cycles huh? um, towards the end of the Asian crisis and uh, the dot-com bubble, the GFC. What you can see here is, of course, all the valuations have really come down and brought it to about close to 50 or 60% of market cap GDP. <coughs> um, now the difference between um, now, then in 2009 and now in 2020 is that we were still at the time a, uh, a, a sub-investment grade uh, sovereign in terms of credit rating by all the major credit rating agencies by, led by S&P, Pitch, and Moody's. Now, currently, we're triple B plus. We were double B minus before. We were, in fact, a solid double B credit for a long time, you know, since the Asian crisis. And you can see here also, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, GDP per capita has gone up to 7,900. Our government to GDP also had come down from 55% to close to 42%. And our ranking in the ease of doing uh, business have gone down, meaning that we've got, uh, we've actually, sorry, gone up in the ranking from 144 to 95. And our GIR reserves is now a healthy $88 billion, which is close to 7.7 .7 months of import payments. And in terms of um, comparing the, our GIR with our total external debt of the country, it's actually we're a net creditor country. So you can say that entering this uh, pandemic health crisis, uh, we are actually in the best state of the economy since probably in the in the 60s, in over 50 years. And therefore, should we deserve um, a, um, a sell down in the market? Well, again, that's for the investors to, to uh, I guess, decide no? whenever they invest in this market. Um, well, just a, a quick and a long rundown of what's happened <coughs> in years. If you look at the best performing sectors for the PSDI. These are the three best performing sectors uh, led by banks and financials. Our Philippine banks are now among the most well capitalized banks in the world. Um, probably not as capitalized as the Canadian banks, but again, very good in terms of capitalization, in terms of non performing loans, loans or bad assets. Uh, we have a, a very low uh, single digit number. I think the industry. Pre-COVID or pre lockdown was around 1.4% of total loans. The sector price to book was around 1.5 to two times uh, price to book. Of course, uh, this uh, came crashing down to below book for most banks except for one bank, which is, which is the largest bank video. But again, concerns about potential uh, NPLs uh, expanding, especially a lot of SMEs, for example, having a uh, a difficult time um, during this crisis will, of course, weigh down on non-performing loans. Um, but if you have a medium to long-term view, banks, of course, will still be um, resilient. Now, the property sector, and uh, I guess I'll defer to my good friend and my partner, business partner, David Lee, to later in the panel to discuss more about this. But basically, uh, it's uh, right now being challenged, of course, by 
the post ECQ, uh, even the post ECQ, uh, now we're in ECQ, a lot of uh, companies are still not fully um, allowing the employees to go back to the, to the office. A lot have embraced what we call uh, work from home. And of course, uh, there's some concerns about the uh, viability of BPOs uh, with regards to the uh, possible onshoring of, of, of uh, some BPO jobs, especially now that we're seeing a, a sharp increase in unemployment in a lot of the major countries, like in the developed countries led by the U.S. Um, and we've seen also um, challenges in the Pogo front. No? Uh, a lot of the online gaming operations, of course, are right, right now being uh, subjected to possible clampdown or increase in regulatory ta taxes, and et cetera, et cetera. So these are a bit of the headwinds that the, the property sector is uh, currently facing. Um, there's also a positive uh, development, hopefully, with the revised IRR of the REIT law. Uh, we can see listings in the market and that will probably create a new asset class and possibly uh, act as a catalyst for the property sector uh, beyond the short term. The conglomerates also have done very well over the last 10 decades, uh, 10 years, of course, because of their diversified holdings. Uh, it's a large portion of the index, I think more than 30%, around close to 40 and we've seen a sharp rating as a result of the uh, net foreign outflows in the market. And we've seen single digit multiples for a lot of these conglomerates, except for one conglomerate called SM Investments, the largest company of them all. Um, and usually these conglomerates are tied to the state of the economy and usually the first to move in a uh, stock recovery. So again, some pressures also uh, with regards to uh, as a result of this uh, COVID uh, crisis. As you can see here, we've seen a lot of analysts, both in the sell side and buy side, meaning fund managers and uh, stockbrokers, uh, analysts have also sharply um, changed their initial 10% earnings growth at the start of the year. In fact, as early as uh, early March, the market was still looking forward to a 10% earnings growth. But after the lockdown in March, or the in a reduction in consensus, consensus uh, market earnings growth. Now. So from 7%, that was like T minus one, uh, that's a month ago, and now currently it's about close to 20%. Now, I'm willing to um, uh, make a bet that earnings will be again revised lower once we see the third quarter in the in in the third quarter, the second quarter earnings support or of of these sorts of companies, and we might see a possible negative 25% uh, earnings growth for the market by end of 2020. Uh, again, not so good, not uh, in terms of, uh, and also let me say that uh, even for the macroeconomic numbers that we may see, uh, we may not be able to recognize the GDP number for the second quarter, mainly because we've, we've gone through close to 10 weeks of um, pandemic driven lockdowns or ECQ and uh, four weeks of GCQ. I don't think that will really have um, um, it will really have a, a significant adverse impact on real, real GDP output for the second quarter and moving forward for the rest of the year. Now, for the sector earnings growth expectations, of course, consumer discretionary, uh, for example, um, has uh, increased. No? I mean, um, in, in the first quarter, um, and because on the back of strong consumer spending, but again, with the lockdown, with the ECQ, we expect this to go down further. In fact, currently, a lot of analysts are expecting a, 91, a negative 91% earnings growth for the sector. For consumer, consumer staples, of course, uh, food agribusiness has done very well, food processing also, and it's the positive, um, around close to positive 15%. Uh, in the first quarter, but currently we're looking at, a lot of the analysts are looking at 
and banks and financials are down also. Um, in the first quarter, it was a small single digit, but uh, now they're looking at a possible 14% negative earnings growth. And for gaming, of course, it's understandable. Um, uh, again, all gaming uh, operations of uh, integrated resorts have uh, gaming companies have been shut down. Therefore, they're looking at a 97% contraction in earnings moving forward. For property here, um, in the first quarter, we've seen a sharp um, actual uh, reduction in earnings. And for the full year, I think analysts are looking at around negative 18%. Telecom, uh, the telecom sector um, has been a bright spot in the market led by PLDT and Globe. And uh, even though in the first quarter we've seen a slight contraction in earnings, full year, analysts are looking at a, a small positive uh, growth for, for Telco. Now for utilities, again, led by the power companies uh, like Meralco and of course uh, the water utility companies like I mean, the water, which is reduction also in earnings. Um, and now they have 11% for the full year. The holding firms, the same. Uh, they're looking at close to 31% contraction for the full year. Um, and for industrials, for uh, the expectations are about 3% positive growth, slight positive. And mining will still be done uh, by the end of the year, close to 30 So um, we've seen a lot of uh, supply and demand disruption or disruption. They say over the, the last couple of months since the start of the pandemic driven uh, uh, lockdowns, the government has actually uh, come out and step, uh, step up in terms of the um, pursuing economic stimulus, no? uh, both fiscal and monetary, as I showed earlier, in terms of macroeconomic uh, indicators, in terms of fiscal space, the government has really room to borrow and uh, spend um, and, and do some uh, spending to boost consumer uh, spending, of course, and hopefully firms to start investing again. So the social amelioration program of close to 18 million families, that's about 5,000 to 8,000 per family, has started over the last two months, and that's about 200 billion. Um, you have the build, build, Build program of the government that's continuing right now in the Philippine Economic Stimulus Act that's, uh, that was passed by Congress together with the Bayanian Act. And of course, the new, uh, they changed the name of Chitira to create uh, basic a tax reform to lower the corporate income tax, accelerate the, the, lo the lowering of the corporate income tax from the current 30% to 25%. Hopefully, these uh, initiatives will be passed by Congress uh, soon. But basically, uh, the government has announced a close to around 8.8% of GDP in terms of both monetary and fiscal stimulus. On the monetary side, the BSP has announced a 200 billion um, treasury buyback uh, program that will basically uh, infuse liquidity in the system. It lowered their overnight rates to a, a record low um, of 2.75%. And uh, we serve requirement cuts also for 200 basis points that introduce about 200 billion uh, in the financial system. So currently, the whole financial system is awash with liquidity right now. And with the government stimulus uh, package that we've uh, done, this is really calibrated to spur consumers to go out and spend again, whether online or offline, depends. And of course, for firms to keep their employees uh, in the payroll. But unfortunately, uh, we're seeing a lot of SMEs having some challenging uh, times for that uh, with regards to um, their cash burn. Um, again, the expected return in terms of end, uh, the end of the year, we're looking at possibly 6.8 as our base case scenario and 7,200. Uh, so best case, uh, it's about 16 times forward P using 2 to 21 earnings growth of around 25%. I don't know what uh, fall financial or April has for, for the year, but our expectation is that we're not far from our base case in our 6,800 or around 15 times P. Uh, the worst case possibly, we can still have one leg down depending on, on 
both sentiment and of course fundamental uh, uh, data or we might see a correction, especially when earnings come out in the third quarter and the fourth quarter, we might see a correction. Now, in terms of post-COVID industry trends, uh, we're seeing these four major trends. First of all, the acceleration of digital formation. We've seen a uh, sharp increase in traffic for online platforms, particularly whether it's in banking, like uh, my former bank BPI, for example, they've seen a 40%, 50% increase in using their online uh, banking platform. Uh, I guess the rest of the banks also have seen that uh, increase in traffic. We've also seen an increase in online shopping uh, or what you call um, um, e-commerce uh, platforms for a lot of these uh, retail and even for, for fast food restaurants and the like. We've seen increase also a focus on sustainability strategies, meaning, you know, trying to um, put up their own strategy in terms of uh, environmental and sustainability corporate governance strategies to again weather um, and improve no? their their footprint. Um, a lot of fund managers or investors globally has been looking at ESG, and that's why I think a lot of uh, the listed companies have been looking at ESG initiatives for their own strategies uh, moving forward uh, in the post-pandemic world. Uh, shift in consumer preference and priorities also have seen basic necessities being the priority right now and the consumer dis um, luxury goods or you know um, uh, high ticket items I think um, are, are not going to do well post pandemic because a lot of people would not be focusing on that but basic on basic items or consumer uh, goods and last but not the least would be the work from home and um, a phenomenon that we're seeing that we've seen over the past three months. All of us here mostly are, of course, in there right now um, um, at home um, watching this webinar. And moving forward, I would see possibly a lot of businesses doing a localization strategy where they will be uh, trying to be closer to where their stakeholders are located. You know? um, for example, those who are working in Quezon City instead of traveling to the south, going to Makati and, you know, the gig BGC, they'd rather work close to home and would not want to, let's say, travel, use public transport, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these trends are going to be there, I think, I think, over the medium term. Now, in terms of potential sector winners, I, uh, I think this is the, the core of our topic uh, this afternoon. Um, over the medium term, our winners, uh, sector winners, uh, we expect, as I mentioned earlier, telecommunications and ICT has done very well in, in this uh, environment. Um, the demand increase for broadband services have shot up uh, recently. And I guess right now, possibly the, there's going to be room for a third telco moving forward. Uh, and this is not a plug to, of course, the third telco detail to the community, but it seems that there will, there will be some room for another telco operator moving forward. Now, uh, this is the favorite of, uh, sector, of course, of uh, my friend David, office property, I think will continue to do well. I hope he agrees with me later on, we'll discuss that. Um, even with the work from home, we're going to see still uh, demand for commercial office. Um, again, we're looking at this from a medium term point of view. Uh, whether it's coming from BPO, SPOGO, or traditional corporate uh, corporates, we're going to see uh, still a resilient, uh, healthy demand. Of course, we're not ruling out an increase in vacancy rates uh, moving forward, especially in the short term, but eventually we think uh, office will continue to do well. Uh, also another bright spot because of the digitalization and e-commerce will be logistics and storage or warehouses. This will do very well. Uh, in the digitalization efforts of a lot of companies. Um, um, they would rely more on logistics, uh, like aggregators, for example, the growth of Grab, um, Lala Move, uh, et cetera, et cetera, has really done very phenomenal, especially with the growth of Lazada uh, in terms of the on their online uh, business, uh, e-commerce business has, has done very well. Fintech solutions, I think, uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of consumers are saying is that, or, or experiencing is that 
they can do everything online. You don't have to go to the branches. So this will have post problem for a lot of the traditional brick and mortar banks. Uh, manufacturing agriculture, I think, will continue to do well. Um, manufacturing, one is that possibly we're going to be one of the beneficiary, maybe not the major beneficiary of a move transfer in, in uh, supply chains from China as uh, the US, Japan, and other in the EU um, try to uh, lessen their reliance on, in China in terms of uh, their supply chain productions. Agriculture, of course, it goes without saying, agriculture food uh, business would do very well. And of course, that was last but not the least, healthcare. I mean, in the midst of this uh, pandemic crisis, we've seen a lot of telemedicine or telehealth care uh, services, both for first institutional being done online and not anymore, of course, having a face-to-face -face, you know, with your doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Now, look at the laggards. Of course, uh, uh, there will be challenges moving forward for certain sectors, like hospitality, tourism related. The airline business have done a really uh, very, I mean, earnings for, for Cebu Pacific and PAL in the first quarter have really dropped sharply. And of course, for hotels and hospitality you know, uh, businesses, um, of course, we've heard of the closure of uh, Marco Polo Hotel in Davao. Uh, we're going to see also, uh, or even the renowned Victoria Court, for example, in the motel business is having a, a difficult time. Um, now, going to fast food dining uh, experience, we're also going to see dining um, challenge in this post-COVID environment. Um, most likely, we'll, a lot of the fast food uh, businesses will have to concentrate on delivery and digital platforms. Transportation, again, will also be a problem, not only for domestic, but international also. Even with the GCQ, for example, we've seen uh, a, a challenging transportation uh, problem uh, because of the uh, lack of uh, transport services for the public. Retail malls will have a difficult time uh, with regards to, of course, convincing um, retailers to go to the malls. Um, and that will be a, ch a challenge uh, for uh, the mall uh, developers. And of course, that will also have an impact on residential real estate moving forward. Last but not the least, financial services. I guess I mentioned earlier, um, I think FinTech solutions uh, will be uh, growing and traditional brick and mortar uh, branch type of uh, operations will have to be lessened moving forward. Okay, so uh, what are the investment strategies in the Philippine equities and the new normal? Well, first of all, we think, yes, you can invest, you can make money in this kind of market, selective positioning in good quality names that were hit hard by, of course, this pandemic driven crisis. Investors are betting that consumer discretionary conglomerates, cyclical sectors like real estate, financial services will recover uh, over the medium term once in a post COVID environment. But again, <clears throat> you'll have different kinds of growth. But basically, you will see uh, not a V shaped type of recovery for these companies, but more of a U shaped. Um, and also, I guess, moving forward, it's not like that you're just going to buy beta stocks or large cap, and then that's it. No? Uh, we've seen a sharp rally over the market uh, over the last couple of months, and this has been led by actually the big names, particularly the SM uh, names like SM Investments, SM Prime, and the Ayala uh, companies like Ayala Land, Ayala Corp, uh, JG Summit, and, and all these large cap companies. But we're also seeing a lot of mid cap and small cap names uh, being left behind. So again, thematic investing based on emerging post pandemic trends like work from home, localization, e-commerce, digitalization, digital content consumption will be mainstays of the new normal. So we're going to see an emergence of the new economy uh, coming from this new normal quote unquote uh, that we're going to see and possibly a reduction of the old economy businesses that we are used, we're used to seeing a lot of those brick and mortar traditional businesses that will have to reinvent themselves and, and become more relevant in that post pandemic world. Well, that's my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, my fellow panelists uh, with regards to an engaging afternoon with regards to this topic. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, PJ, for the robust discussion. 
na pagmeting virtual club. So uh, we will see you again in the Q and A. Before we proceed with the program, may we inform the inductees that the induction will be held after the panel discussion at around 2.20 p.m. Thank you. Now, if you have questions for our speaker and panelists, please use the chat box. We'll have a Q&A portion later. And now for our final discussion, may introduce our first, our esteemed uh, panelists to join our speaker for today's discussion. Our first panelist is Ms. Eileen Clemente. She is the chairman and CEO of Raja Travel Corporation, a leader in the Philippine travel and tourist sector. Eileen has served as president of several tourism-related associations Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So Please. I'll just be um, quick on, on just uh, a, a slide, uh, some slides that I will show just so we have a picture of the, of the Philippines uh, when it comes to tourism, no? So there, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So um, in terms of global performance, we're really outperforming. Um, this is prior to COVID. We have been outperforming almost all sectors. And while um, everyone has been contributing one out of 20 jobs, uh, at, at that point in time already, we were already contributing one out of 10 jobs. Um, this is apart from the fact that we have been 2.5% uh, of global GDP and so on. And their growth has been higher than some of the rest of the other industries. Now, um, for the Philippines, we are actually um, in the top five contributors to GDP. So it cannot be said that it's, 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 it's really um, an insignificant industry. And this, is just, this doesn't even include the economic multiplier. Um, again, of course, when it came to COVID, um, there were certain things that uh, happened because we are very, we're a very sensitive market. But we had some major learnings. One is it's very slow for for things to move. That's why it's probably a cause of one of the things why recovery is slow. Um, also, people were not um, collaborating fast enough. Um, standard standards and protocols were very localized and not global. Uh, and then technologies will need to improve, no? Um, in the global sense, we already created a lot of global protocols in place. So it's a matter of having this done um, also and applied locally so that there are guidelines already. So even if each LGU can, will do their own guidelines, they should be following a set of guidelines that are already globally available. Um, the second learning is, those are the lot of excuses not to implement what needed to implement. Have no choice now but to implement them. We have been talking about this, so it's not purely on economics, but a lot on sustainability. Um, of course, greed has also been tempered because it's not all about economics anymore. Um, we are already in the path of recovery. We're between stage three and four. Um, and the only problem that is uh, limiting us in doing this is uh, the, the different players that are involved, especially government. And what does the normal look like? Um, it looks like um, there will be several technology changes. There's a lot of protocols that will be in place when it comes to health and sanitation and so on. So um, there have been those designs, but what are the questions? The questions are re that are important is, is, is this a realization for an overdue reinvention? The problem, probably with tourism is that most of them are closed corporations and not available for public um, purchases except for inter international chains and maybe a lot on the hospitality. But there are actually a lot of the players that are very good. So if you're going to be investing in this industry, you have to look at those who have reinvented or will be reinventing themselves and have the capability to reinvent. So, um, it's, it's not still inconsequential. If you're talking about leisure tours, maybe that's the last of the 
things that will probably uh, be here, no? But there are different types of trips that happen or different purposes of travel. One is leisure, the other one is corporate, one is deployment. And as I mentioned before, seafarers are already the first to be able to travel. So these are the different parts of travel. Also for meetings and events, even if there are now meetings that are happening this way, like Zoom or all of these other meetings, there will still be the opportunity to have a hybrid. Why do I say that? Because actually everything, a five hour meeting in Zoom is equal to one hour face to face. So you have to remember that as well. So we know that there will be several um, alternatives. I will just stop there, but their tourism activities cannot be replaced because there are things that will need uh, experiences and uh, you know, touching the sea, being in the sea, tasting food, having the right selfie, um, having these um, certain feelings when you do certain activities like riding a roller coaster, these cannot be replaced. So if the industry is here to stay, it's here to stay. If we're talking about, are we moving, um, are we moving uh, in terms of direction where tourism will go? It will definitely change. And if you will be investing, invest in those that will have these in place already or want to um, mutate into something better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Eileen Clemente. I feel good when you said that um, uh, tourism is here to stay. <laughs> so, pwede pang mag-travel ulit. Okay, our next speaker is the CEO and President of Lichu Property Management. He is considered the leading commercial real estate broker in the Philippines who helped put his company on the real estate map. A sought-after speaker on the webinar circuit, please welcome Mr. David Lee Chu. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me over and for having me uh, be part of your panel. Thank you. Would you have some opening statements to make, David? Uh, yeah, okay. So, sorry. So, yeah. Um, so, I guess there's a lot of bad news going around in the market, and uh, that's something that is um, uh, so prevalent now. And I, I, I guess the, the, the human psychology is, is to just keep absorbing that to the point where, where, the only thing you're reading is bad news. And I, I base this on the numerous people that I've been talking to from all walks of life that are just um, trapped in their homes and, and that's all that they see right now. Um, but what, what many people are not able to see are the many good things that are, are, that are happening despite all these problems. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for as a country and as, a, and as an economy. Mm, I guess the most important thing from my field is that uh, despite all the odds, the office market up to today has not contracted. Uh, and in all likelihood, uh, there will be a significant expansion that's going to happen towards uh, from, from the time of August onwards all the way through to 2021. And I say this because... Um, the Philippine economy has been, uh, ever since the BPO sector started in the Philippines, uh, the, 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 the Philippines has become a, uh, a recovery solution program for many companies. What I mean by that is that as, as companies go into recession, they use uh, the labor in the Philippines to offshore to the Philippines uh, uh, to be able to re reduce costs and increase productivity. And um, I think that's going to continue even more because the sense of urgency to offshore to the Philippines will be greater than ever because this is probably the biggest global economic uh, crisis that we are uh, going through in the last 100 years. Um, and... Uh, 
so I think that the the Pogo the the, the Pogo sector together with the BPO sector will keep the office market alive and well. And uh, as far as the Pogo sector is concerned, you're going to see a lot of that um, growth happen once the travel bans are lifted, and that the government and the Pogo sector achieve some relevant compromise. Uh, some relevant compromise to be able to uh, continue operating in the Philippines. As you all know, um, there's been a lot of social, uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, press against the Pogo sector. And I think our campaign is to, uh, is to make people appreciate how important the Pogo sector is to this market, to the Philippine economy and that we have to do our best to encourage them to grow in the Philippines. Um, and uh, as far as tourism is concerned, I, I like, I, I like um, the, the previous uh, presentation because uh, I believe that of all, the, of all the possible sectors to develop, tourism will be the easiest, most scalable, uh, most scalable uh, industry to grow and the quickest to grow because the demand is there. We don't have to generate demand for it. And we have inherent talent, ability, and gifts such as our beautiful islands got given, got given to the Philippines to be able to become a relevant global tourism player. And I say this at a time when uh, tourism numbers, foreign tourism numbers in the Philippines are at an all-time high at 8 million. But if you look outside the Philippines, 8 million actually is a very small number relative to the to other countries. And um, the other thing I have to say is that we have to use this time to figure out how to dramatically increase foreign tourism in the Philippines. So we have to come up with a very credible program, use this time of quiet and this time when very few people in the world are willing to ride on a plane, to use this quiet time to figure things out for the Philippines so that when the gates open again, we'll be ready. And we have to, like it or not, despite all the propaganda for and against, we have to accept the fact that we cannot grow this economy without the help of China. China is the single biggest investor in the world. It is the single biggest tourism market in the world. Uh, and the home of the most number of the home of most number of entrepreneurs in the world. They are a significant economic uh, force globally. And the Phil and China has ignored the Philippines for the last 60 years. It's only in the last three years that they ever uh, kind of uh, paid any attention to the Philippines. And what they are investing here is nothing compared to what they have done elsewhere in the world. And with China will come other investors from the region. And speaking of region, we have to ask ourselves, besides uh, fruits and nuts, what else are we exporting to the rest of Asia? Very little. Yes, the semiconductor and computer assembly <clears throat> industries are our top two exports on the gross. But if you net that against imports, the, 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 the margin between the export and imported components are, are not as big as the locally in, uh, generated products in the Philippines. And so we have to ask ourselves as a people and as a country, how much more trade can we open up with the rest of Asia? Because we do so little with the rest of Asia. Uh, so there are many things to be thankful for. And uh, maybe the most important thing to look out for is the fact that in the next, within the next 12 months, between nine to 12, infrastructure projects are going to be completed all at the same time. We have never seen this injection of in infrastructure since the 1960s. Between the three, three bridges, the three roads, the three major highways, with 
with uh, Joey Lim can uh, is building one of them or, or a number of them, and uh, and uh, and the airports that are opening up in the next twelve months and the uh, the new railway systems that will be opening up in the next twelve months will be unprecedented. It will benefit the geography between Clark all the way to Cavite Laguna. And more importantly, 30 million people will benefit from that. And that represents that geography and that number of people, 30 million people, represents close to 60% of the country's GDP. And uh, the immediate impact of that is that traffic will be cut by half for most people. And as we all know, the regular employee outside Mancom, the regular employee, which is 70, 80% of the workforce, 80% of the workforce, is spending six hours a day going from home to work and back. And that's going to uh, that's going to be cut by half. And that will translate to significant economic productivity, which will allow us to recover from this crisis much, much faster. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, David. Now our next speaker is the president and CEO of Metro Pacific Investment Corporation and sits on the board of several companies in the MPIC group. He was awarded Best CEO for Investor Relations by Corporate Governance Asia for five consecutive years from 2012 to 2016. Mr. The, our speaker is also the founding treasurer of Sharefield. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker, let us welcome Mr. Jose Maria Joey Lim. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity to say a few words about uh, MPIC and the role we play. As David uh, just said earlier, a lot of the, uh, the, the, recovery is going to depend on how fast infrastructure is built to accommodate the new normal. And fortunately, uh, PLDT is, uh, is, is, is quite uh, capable of uh, handling the traffic despite the, the sudden shift to digital uh, meetings and so forth. Uh, I think they are going to be doing well. Now, in the rest of our businesses in the portfolio, uh, probably Meralco, Tollways, and uh, water would be the biggest ones. Uh, then we would have some the the rail and hospitals uh, being the smaller ones. No? Our Meralco and water are basically affected by the shutdown of factories, but there is a uh, there's a co commensurate rise in residential uh, uptake of both power and water that tends to offset this. So they're not too bad. Meralco is doing about 26% of what it used to. Uh, it, we have some power plants in the south as well, in Visayas and Mindanao. Those numbers are actually up. Instead of uh, decreasing, they're actually up 2%. Now, in the case of toll roads, the lockdown caused a severe dislocation of both rail and tollways. But now the now that the restrictions on the ECQ has been softened, the traffic is now back to about 70% of normal. Whereas uh, the other one, LRT, because it's public transport, is still severely affected and we're not allowed to take more than 12% of the capacity of the trains at this time. Uh, that, may, uh, that may change soon because we're telling the regulators and the department concerned that uh, what, what's the point of uh, you know, keeping the very strict social distancing inside the cars when you're only causing a backup of, of uh, the queue who, who are forced to wait for a longer period of time next to each other where there's no social distancing at all because they're right beside each other by, uh, in, in the queue. It's actually better to put them into the trains and let them run, run the course of the trains and then they can, they can uh, disembark. No? So in general, we, we are doing quite okay. Uh, our role in the holding company 
is to ensure that the liquidity management is always uh, tightly guarded. And so this means to say we, we know that there is a drop in the revenues and we know that there are certain commitments that we, we need to meet in terms of our, our concession agreements and so forth that dictate a certain amount of capex. So it's a balancing act of uh, keeping your liquidity against the amount of capex commitments that are needed. So you would tend to reprioritize things. No? And if, for example, the right of way that certain roads, we have about 83 billion pesos worth of road works going on. About 51 billion of that was supposed to be spent in 2020. That's going to drop to about 36 billion, whether we like it or not, simply because the, the right of way is not available. But knowing that we are going to drop, our, our task now is to decide how to recover the, you know, the 14 or 15 billion that uh, was lost this year and how fast can we recover in order to help the economy recover. Because obviously more investments will be a stimulus to the company. So I would say those are the two top priorities we have, managing liquidity and at the same time, keeping an eye to the recovery of the economy because we know infrastructure has a special place. Uh, now, going to our other, our, our hospital business, that has been in the forefront of this fight against the uh, pandemic. And of course, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, natural to expect uh, most people who had elective procedures have opted to postpone because they're afraid of infection rates. So uh, the risk of infections. No? And so uh, at this time when COVID is, there is there's no known uh, vaccine and the, it's, not, it's not really clear whether the vaccines that are being rushed are going to be reliable and whether they will be effective over the long term or not. So the only way the hospital can prepare for that is to actually divide its operations into a, a uh, you know infectious disease type of uh, facility versus non-infectious type, so that people who have elective procedures can can feel safe about going to the hospitals. Uh, I, I would say that uh, all all our CEOs are thinking along those lines at the moment, and if they're not able to do it physically, they are able to do it by floors. No? So you have a segregation of certain floors. And in fact, we're thinking about some of the hospitals becoming more uh, you know, uh, dedicated to COVID type uh, treatments so that the capacity of the other hospitals can be left uh, relatively focused on uh, the kinds of elective procedures they need to think about. Uh, of course, uh, to our shareholders, uh, what we are trying to to reassure them about is that we are very hands-on in, in adjusting to the new normal. We're trying to stress test in as many scenarios as possible what the government will do to, 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 in terms of restrictions on, on the movements of the pub, public at large. And our own creditors who are concerned about the, um, the uh, balance that we used to have and whether we can still maintain the, the credit worthiness that were presented in the original case to their credit committees. So it's, it's, uh, it's busy times for us. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joeen, our last but not the least panelist. She is the Vice President and Head of Research of Call Financial. She is a chartered financial analyst and was the president of the Philippine Charter of the CFA Society from 2009 to 2016 and currently sits on its board of advisors. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Ms. April Lynn Lee Tan. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry I'm having technical problems with my video, but anyway, um, I just like to share my thoughts on the market. I guess PJ has done a great job in talking about the stock market already. 
but um, for me, I just like to talk about my views about the most recent rally of the market. So first of all, I mean, the market, I'm sure you know, have, has gone up substantially from after falling to as low as 4,200 to around 6,500. So that's quite a significant increase. And what has changed? Well, of course, um, the number of cases have peaked all over the world. And because of that, economies are reopening and it looks like the worst is over. Possible treatments and vaccines are showing promise. And aside from that, I think, um, you know, global central banks are showing that they will do whatever it takes to make sure that economies will recover. Um, but you know, um, that said, I think uh, I've been very vocal about my views that I don't think that the recovery of our market is sustainable, at least not in the short term. Um, first of all, because we feel that the impact of uh, coronavirus is going to be severe. Uh, PJ has already mentioned that the view really is not a V-shaped recovery, but rather um, more of a U-shaped recovery of the of uh, the economy rather actually if you think about it it's going to be like an inverted chain rather than a u um and um the the problem is if you look at the consensus forecast right now um analysts are expecting 2021 earnings to already match 2019 earnings which in our opinion is um too optimistic at this point. And at the 6,500 level of the market, we feel that um, people are already pricing a uh, recovery in earnings in 2021 that matches 2019. It's more of a valuation issue for us. We are not denying that earnings will be better compared to the second quarter because the second quarter was really bad. But we feel like at the current level, um, people are already pricing in something which is a lot more optimistic, a lot more optimistic than um, what we think will happen. So that's one of our issues. And um, well, we feel like another risk is that our government is a uh, very conservative when it comes to uh, stimulus spending. So um, when they talk about the various bills, um, they say it's around 7% of GDP, but you have to note that they'll be spending 7% of GDP over several years. They're not gonna spend it in um, 2020. In fact, for 2020, the 700 billion stimulus is still um, not yet in the bank because uh, they want to keep the deficit to around eight to 9% of GDP. So um, that said, if we go back to you know um to the definition of um gdp which is consumers plus investments um plus exports plus government consumers investments and exports are all going to be weak this year next year probably they'll recover but still way below 2019 level our only hope is the government that our government is also being um I think quite um, conservative because it wants to keep our debt levels and deficit levels to conservative levels. So, um, you know, that said, I feel that, um, you know, current levels of the market cannot be sustained. So although, yes, I feel like, um, you know, there will be a good opportunity for us to buy the market, but in light of the um, this connection between valuation and um, fundamentals, at least for the next two years, I feel like we should wait for a better opportunity to come in. So, yeah, I guess that ends my um, views for the market. I think PJ has talked about it um, most. I mean, we share the same view of the resilient sectors and the vulnerable sectors, but but um, I just like to add my views on the market today and whether or not we should continue to participate or whether or not we should wait for better prices to come in. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, April. Maybe call in again, PJ, 
uh, for the Q&A. Our panelists and, and our speaker will be joined by Ms. Boots Garcia, Sherfield Trustee, who will be moderating the question and answer. Uh, can I be viewed? Okay. Thank you for all your uh, insightful uh, comments, uh, PJ and everyone else. Uh, I just like I just like to uh, contextualize the way we're going to ask the questions here because, uh, as you know, Sherfield is uh, Sherfield's mission is to educate, empower, and enable our investors. So there may be questions that related to investing in the capital markets and all that. But just to to start with. Uh, this is a question, I'd like to take advantage of the fact that Joey has to be, uh, is available only up to a certain time. I'd just like to say, uh, Joey mentioned uh, for, for, a, for Eileen, David, and Joey, this is really a question for you. Speaking about your own company and the businesses that you are in, what would you say are the signals and indicators that you are now ready to operate and grow under the new normal? Uh, maybe we can start with Eileen. Okay, so um, for for me, there's a lot. It's a, it's different from other industries because we do a lot of preparations, and it's in the preparation that is key. Uh, so once we we do our preparations, meaning have we used the technology where we can use the technology? So it's not just a matter of having a product, but having the right technology to create a seamless and safe travel. So once we've done that, that is of course the signal for us. The second is of course the, uh, we're creating already travel bubbles that we call. Travel bubbles are um, corridors within destinations that we know can travel between the two points already. So we're not probably going to start opening the entire world right away, but working in the travel bubbles. So. Uh, that's the way we're preparing for this one. Okay, uh, David, would you have uh, some quick answer to that for the property yeah. market or the property market, which you particularly said would be a uh, growth area? Yeah, so the office market has been the only property class that's producing any cash flow for many developers. And the whole challenge is how to make the, the building safe. And I, I could share that for many companies, especially uh, the ones we service, plus the ones uh, our own office, is that sometimes after the home, the next safest place is the office. And, and that's because in a very controlled geography, you're able to sanitize as much as you can and do, uh, do using technology, do a lot of protocol uh, protocols to be able to make it so safe. So I'm glad to see building owners graduating from the magic stick in inspector in the gate to now thermal scanners with uh, yeah. that, that are non-contact, right? And they don't choke the line because these are, these are scanners that you just walk through just like in the airport with no hassle. Um, so I, I think that's... Uh, I think technology is, is the way to go with making buildings very safe. Okay, Joey, any uh, res your response? Yeah, okay. I, th I think uh, for, uh, for some of the companies, we're going with the easier uh, changes. Now, for example, uh, payments. Uh, in the case of Maralco, Mainilad, uh, and Tollways, there is a high degree of manual payments involved. So we're trying to do that now purely uh, digital and electronic so that it's contactless. Even in the tollways, we're trying to get the, the use of the uh, electronic uh, tags. Uh, we're giving it away free in order to force them to, to pay uh, through digital uh, means now, instead of manual payments. In the case of uh, operations, it's more specific to each. No? And for example, in our generating plant, in a power plant, that has to operate continuously. And so you can still do things to protect your employees in there by, uh, for example, putting them on certain shifts, wherein mm -hmm. 
they do not uh, leave the plant for uh, a number of weeks and then they go off duty, just like in the oil rigs, wherein a team, will, a crew will come in and then stay there for two weeks, then they'll go back home and, and stay. That way uh, their, their exposure to, to each other is minimized. In the case of hospitals, I think we mentioned uh, that we're trying to isolate the using uh, infection control. No? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're starting in, you know, uh, obviously there are other improvements that we can do, but at the moment that's where our focus is now. At least with our consumers, we're trying to make them as, uh, as safe as possible. Okay. Um, question for PJ and April. What should investors look for in company be behaviors during the pandemic to maintain uh, investors' confidence? Okay, um, shall I go first? Yes, um, and then April. Yes, great question, uh, Boots. I think what companies should be doing in this um, environment right now is to reassure investors that they are putting um, priority to the well-being of their stakeholders, particularly uh, not only the, the investing public or the shareholders, but basically the, the employees, their consumers, their, their um, uh, everyone. And as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, the class of sustainability initiatives moving forward will be really going to be strong, uh, again, to be able to counteract, of course, and adjust the new normal that we're going to see. Uh, there will be some pains, some adjustments uh, for a lot of these companies. And uh, I think it will, it will act, it, there will have to be some what you call, um, I guess, um, closer um, community uh, shareholder, stakeholder engagement that will be needed uh, by these companies. And, and, and we've seen a lot of uh, uh, large and, and medium-sized uh, uh, listed companies that have really gone uh, out of their way to help support their communities you know, by um, not only, of course, contributing to uh, efforts uh, to, to help their, their clients, their, their consumers, their, but, but basically even, even uh, their, their uh, communities. Uh, so, I, so I think that's going to be important moving forward. April, would you have... Uh... Yeah. So, so yeah, aside, so aside from that, like for um, shareholders, especially minority shareholders like us, um, I think aside from the what PJ has said, I think uh, it would be great that the companies uh, continue to be transparent and honest even during these difficult times. Because during the good times, of course, mm -hmm. it's so easy to talk to companies i mean they're so excited to share all the good numbers but during the bad times there are uh, unfortunately some people who you know would rather not talk but you know um i don't think that uh, creates a lot of confidence in people i guess for us i mean there's no point in lying because everybody knows that things are bad right now um so i think common common shareholders or minority shareholders would appreciate um, honesty, transparency, and I, I would say even on the transparency side, if a company can be detailed about numbers, we would very much be, uh, appreciate details um, on the numbers um, so that at least we can have a more um, informed, we can make more informed decision. Okay. Uh, again, for Chloe, Eileen, and David, Obviously, you are, you know, there's a lot of risks going around uh, affecting your particular business or industry. How are you managing this and mitigating this risk? Of course, we also have to deal with a lot of geopolitical developments in the environment. How have this affected your business and your markets? Maybe Joey can start. And Okay, thank you. Um, well, the risks I think is going to be in, it's going to have to, it, you're going to have to look at it in terms of how the government responds to the new normal, because uh, a lot of this is going to depend on, on the policies adopted 
and the capabilities of government actually to handle the risks of uh, future infections. So uh, to the extent that uh, it affects the movement of people and the uh, economy itself, we will mm -hmm. have to adjust to that. We cannot, uh, we cannot change that. But we can do things in a more efficient and a more uh, uh, maybe purposely, uh, purposeful manner no? in order to protect our employees, protect our consumers, and at the same time, keep all the options open for you know, pushing forward with accelerating projects and cutting back when we don't think the the government is is going to be able to respond you know, for whatever reason. So mm -hmm. because we are so so you know deeply uh, intertwined with the decisions that government makes, we mm -hmm. have to adjust to them. We cannot make the call on our own or on you know. On, in terms of the, you know, for example, the migration policies of, uh, of of other countries is probably going to change, and that I think is going to have an impact on OFW remittances to us, because it'll be harder for OFW workers to go back and forth to their place of work. You know, with all these restrictions. So if this drops, what is the impact on the economy? Those things are 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 the macro. Uh, trends that we have to watch out for, but I think that's 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 the that's the key to it. Just staying on top, ahead of it, ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. Eileen, yeah. So what we're doing actually is to make sure that we're following global standards because if we leave it to the devices of just local government or national government, we're trying to give the influence of global because. If, if you're looking for an acceptable range of standards, it has to be global because we're inviting and we're traveling to international destinations. So if you're applying an international standard to a, even local travel, even just for domestic tourism, then you're removing all of that already. Second mm -hmm. is we are also creating the seal. So there's already a global seal for safety. So that's the next pillar for confidence building. So these are the, some of the things that we're doing already in the industry. Okay, David, uh, any, would you have anything to add? Yeah, I think maybe one of the things that we do is just getting information and understanding that information and data uh, can, can make or break your business. And um, for example, one of the things that we are telling okay. clients is that it is the best time to build something today because uh, the supply is irrationally falling in the next three, four years. But, you know, uh, you're only, we're only able to say that because we have the information <laughs> in hand. That's one of the things that, uh, that we do to mitigate risk in the business. Thank you. Okay, this is... A question well on behalf of investors which anyone or all may want to answer so uh typical questions in the mind of investors what would you advise them whether they're current or potential investors what do i do with my money where do i invest considering that the recovery will take time should i stay invested how do i manage my risk i remember april uh, or was it uh, PJ, who mentioned two possible investment strategies or approaches, correct, PJ? Uh, would you like to elucidate on that further? Yes. Um, I guess the first important thing is that you have to be, you have to stay invested in this market. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I mean, it's so volatile and everything. It can go up and down. We've actually uh, betrayed um, uh, from the lows uh, and and. I share April's concern with regards to being the market being too ahead of itself right now, uh, factoring a lot of the good news and the possible recovery post ECQ. But uh, the the reality is that um, the, I mean, we may have actually seen the bottom for the economy, but moving forward in terms of the growth and the recovery, it may not be as fast uh, a fast recovery. So for investors, I, I recommend to be very patient. Um, meaning 
we don't have to invest all in right now. Um, I recommend uh, also diversifying into other asset classes like fixed income. Uh, and if you can, for example, at some point in time, if there will be REITs, for example, and I think David uh, would agree with me that REITs will create a new asset class that will be much more, I would say, efficient in terms of the risk return uh, parameters compared to, let's say, fixed income and equity. So um, we stay, stay invested and selective in, in, in investing in the market. Would you have anything to add, April? Yeah, um, for me, I, um, I've been telling our investors that, you know, when the market's being sold down, um, it, I mean, we all know um, to be greedy when others are fearful. And this is precisely the time, of course, after the market has gone down, not, not right now when it has rallied so much. Um, you know, let's not forget that it, it really is an opportunity, except that you want to make sure you're still holding on to your stocks when the market does recover, which is why um, I think what's important is risk management to make sure that you only own enough. Uh, because remember right now, liquidity is very important. You don't want to lose liquidity or not have liquidity when you need it. So you invest, but you invest a comfortable size that you can keep for a very long time so that you are sure to be there when the market um, does recover. And that just, you know, it's a buyer's market. So um, don't rush in, um, don't, you know, have this attitude of fear of missing out or FOMO. Um, and of course, um, you know, buy cheap, buy slowly and diversify. I agree with DJ completely. Okay. I think this will be my last question because we've actually extended our time in. I'd like to ask a question on behalf of Sharefill, really, for everybody. Uh, would you have any uh, suggestions or ideas on how Sharefill can support your companies and the industries as you meet the challenges of the crisis? And likewise, what would you advise Sharefill should do to support the investors and the markets at this time? Being an organization of, uh, in, with the interest of protecting, well, not only sh minority shareholders, really, but stakeholders in general. So anyone would like to take a crack at that question? So first, how can we support you? And how, what should we do, on the other hand, to support investors and markets? Would anyone like to take a crack at that? Joey? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think uh, the company has a, uh, has a culture of transparency. We have been... Uh, quite, uh, we, we're, we're usually uh, disclosing anything that has a, an ability to impact our share prices. Now, whether it's here or the impact uh, on, on the prices of our parent company in Hong Kong, because they're, they're actually even more strict about transparency there, no? So, um, but I guess uh, my advice to investors is, uh, is liquidity management is 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 uh, the most important consideration right now? Not not really earnings. Uh, we've even actually announced our our uh, likelihood of reduced dividends to our shareholders. We've already uh, told them in advance that because of the regulatory uh, delays in the water as well as the right of way delays because of COVID in the tollways. The opening, you know, the opening dates and completion of these projects are all going to be pushed back, and therefore our own projected dividends may or may not be impacted. But we're warning them that they should be, they should be prepared for a lower dividend rate. At least this is coming from our operating units. Now we will try to maintain our own dividends at MPIC level if we have the ability to do so. Anyone would like to uh, chip in or chime in? Chime in? I think uh, I, I, I can try to take a stab at that. I, I think um, as, as uh, what Joey was saying about transparency is to be able to propagate governance and transparency, especially now when there's so much turbulence. Um, yeah. Okay. Eileen, you would you or PJ and April? Anyone? Would like to uh, take a crack at that question? 
how well, we can yeah for for the for the tourism industry as I say as I said they're usually small close corporations so um, they're not publicly traded but it they have the portfolio for capitalization is probably something that can be done so it's if ever it will come into play it will be at its infancy stage for for future investments okay that's a very uh, interesting uh, thought uh, Eileen uh, would PJ and April like to make a comment on that question if yeah. Well, first, I think Sheffield has uh, a role to play with regards to protecting, uh, um, I guess, not only minority shareholders, but basically all stakeholders, as you said, Boots. And uh, moving forward, I think in this challenging environment that we have, I think at this point in time, and let me reiterate what uh, Joey, uh, David, um, and, and, and um, April mentioned earlier with regards to the level of transparency uh, that we need at this point. And you know, to help investors make an informed decision uh, with regards to the risk uh, of, of the new normal, the adjustments that companies would have to make. Um, I think investors are willing to you know, support companies that are, of course, candid uh, enough to say that they're having a tough time adjusting in this environment. And if they have to report losses, like, for example, the banks, and I'm not going to uh, be uh, uh, mentioning any, but you know they've really been doing a proactive in terms of uh, provisioning for for possible losses. No? So I think earnings at this point is not a priority. I think there's one question earlier by my good friend Raymond Record in the chat that earnings is not a priority at this point. That's my opinion. It's really more balance sheet management, risk management, as what Joey mentioned. So that's my that's my take. And finally, April. Yeah, um, I think. You know, um, as I've said earlier, um, if and when the market does go down, while as scary as it is, it really is a great opportunity for investors to come in, especially given that in our country, I mean, you only have so many investors um, for us, for example. In, so, so my opinion is maybe investor education should be prioritized right now. Um, for COL Financial, for example, we launched our um, e Easy Investment Program or Peso Cost Averaging Program in during the global financial crisis. And it really has helped us a lot because a lot of the investors who believed in the program bought during the bear market, made a lot of money and continued to save. So I think now is a great opportunity to educate investors and to encourage them to begin their investment programs. Okay, thank you very much and uh, appreciate your spending time to answer the questions. Are there actually several questions from the audience, but uh, in the interest of time, and some of them are industry-specific questions. So uh, we will probably share that with you and perhaps uh, you can uh, answer them uh, at your convenience. So May, Mike, could I... So May, uh, can we give a virtual clap? <laughs> <laughs> to our speakers and for their insightful comments. Yeah, virtual clap. So thank you so much. Thank you for the uh, speaker and panelists. Um, I think we can proceed now to the induction of new members.